This episode of the EV Resource Podcast is brought to you by Titan Auto and Tire. Titan has some of the very few independent auto repair shops in Central Virginia that are qualified to work on EVs and hybrids. And from hybrids to Hummers, they fix everything. For more information and to schedule an appointment for your vehicle, go to TitanAutoTire.com. Coming up this week... Our approach is that people have something that they enjoy driving, that they'll, for one, tell their friends about it, uh, and will be a lot more inclined to want to ride such a vehicle as well as with their friends and the friends of the friends. So you can really start uh, more and more people wanting to have a vehicle that doesn't cause any emissions uh, and also is super fun to drive. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to episode 169 of the EV Resource Podcast. I'm Zach Hurst, and each week I bring you the latest EV news, information, and interviews with industry experts. In this episode, I speak with Nico Nagel, co-founder of Pave Motors, about their next generation lightweight electric motorbike that is sized perfectly between an e-bike and a motorcycle. And with more than 50 miles per charge, this is one that you definitely want to hear about. So, Nico, I want to welcome you to the EV Resource Podcast. I I'm really excited actually to talk with you because the more I've been looking into PAVE as a company, the more questions I've had. I mean, really on the surface, somebody might get the impression that, okay, you're just making another either e-bike or scooter or something like that. But what I'm realizing is that there is just so much more. There's lots of layers that we're going to go through uh, for this conversation. But I want to set that aside because before we get into all of that, I want to give you a chance to tell your story, kind of where you came from and how you got to the point where, um, you know, you're doing what you're doing now. Yeah. First of all, uh, it's great to meet you, Zach. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, and yeah, I'm looking forward to, to kind of giving you a little bit more of the background uh, as well as kind of where we stand now and what's coming next. Um, so I'll uh, start with your, I guess, your first question in terms of uh, where we kind of got started and where the initial idea uh, came from um, when my brother and I started the company in 2019, so about four years ago. Um, so both my brother and I grew up in Germany were driving scooters, uh, so like the 50cc uh, combustion equivalent was very common as a very easy way to get around in cities. E-bikes back then weren't really a thing. Um, so as we grew up and as kind of e-bikes became more and more uh, of a bigger market, uh, especially in 2019 is where we saw really a big or the first big boom in that industry is when my brother and I started really talking about if e-bikes are really the most efficient way of getting around in cities or if there's something that kind of lies in between the e-bikes and the e-motorcycles. Uh, so that is the equivalent of those 50cc scooters that we were used to when we were younger growing up in uh, in Germany. Um, and so we kind of started concepting out some different ideas, basically with the idea of taking the good attributes of the e-bikes, so lightweight, really easy to use and intuitive, and combining those with the good aspects of electric motorcycles. So you get the exhilarating and exciting feeling when you drive it, as well as you get the utility. So you can actually carry grocery bags, you can have a second passenger, you can go further distances without any effort. Uh, and that's really what we've created now with the PAVE BK. Uh, it's kind of a fusion between those two classes and sits right in the middle and falls into that 50cc combustion engine um, equivalent. Uh, and as I said, yeah, we started the company in, in, in 2019, uh, put together a team of uh, phenomenal engineers uh, that have helped us shape the product, uh, make sure it's reliable, uh, can withstand all different types of weather conditions. Uh, if you may know, in New York, the weather can be extreme. Uh, it can be really, really hot in the summer and really, really cold in the winter. So we've really wanted to create something that, uh, withstands all types of weather conditions. And that's what we've done. And we're super proud of that uh, and super excited to start ramping up production uh, in this coming month uh, with the goal uh, of distributing the vehicles on, in the US only for now. And then next year, we want to move into Europe. So mid of next year, we want to move into Europe as well. Uh, the, we're still looking which countries we're going to launch the bikes. But yeah, that's uh, kind of where we stand now. And uh, 
yeah, what's to come. So I hope this gives you a good overview. Yeah, well, it's fascinating that you want to start with the market here in, in the U.S. and then go to Europe because, honestly, you've created something that's perfect for Europe. You know, here in the U.S., not to say that there are definitely a lot of places where this would be uh, highly functional as well as just fun. Uh, New York City, of course, comes to mind as one of the mm-hmm. biggest areas where I think most people, <laughs> half of their commute is sitting still, like they're not actually moving, where the congestion, I mean, ask anybody that's driven anywhere close to Manhattan, and they'll probably tell you they never want to do it again, unless they are, live in that area. <laughs> Hey, everybody, we'll get back to the podcast in just a minute, but I wanted to take a pause and tell you about NordVPN. If you're not using a reliable VPN, your private information could be easily accessed by third parties. NordVPN can protect your online activity, but also provide security to browse safely. I've been using NordVPN for a few years, and while I certainly appreciate knowing that my activity is protected, I also use it to watch the extreme e-racing live even though it's not a broadcast that's available in the United States. I just simply connect to a foreign country where the broadcast is showing, and then I can watch without any problems. This also works well if you're interested in watching anything that you might not be able to access from your current location. Right now, NordVPN is running a Black Friday deal where you can get a subscription for only $2.99 a month and get three additional months. There is a 30-day money-back guarantee too, so you have nothing to lose by trying it out. Make sure you click the link in the show notes for this exclusive author and take the easy step to protecting your data with NordVPN. So this is, I mean, what we're talking about, because part of this podcast is audio. There is going to be a YouTube video as well. So for the people who are just listening in, they're not able to see your background. So what we're talking about is a two-wheeled, smaller we'll call it a mobility device until we get into further definitions of exactly where this slots between a bicycle and more of an electric scooter or motorcycle. I'm curious if you can kind of walk through the the process of kind of, I mean, it is somewhat of an innovative design and not something that we see most of the time people or companies are going to have products that are e-bikes or scooters where you don't really see too many that are in the middle ground there. So talk through the process of why that was so important to, to really land in that space with what you guys are doing. So the, the first point is that we wanted to build something that is approachable and doesn't scream motorcycle, uh, super fast, uh, loud, noisy, and heavy. Uh, We really wanted to create something that people can ride that have no experience or prior experience in riding motorcycles or scooters um, or even bicycles. We've had people test ride our our PAVE that have zero experience in riding any of these devices. And after a couple trips, they felt comfortable on it. And that's exactly what we wanted to achieve. Uh, And in general, I mean, in in order to get mass adoption of these uh, two wheelers, our strong belief is that these vehicles need to be made super easy to ride and super approachable. So that was one thing that we really focused on right from the beginning. And that's where really like uh, from a design perspective, we've taken parts of the frame are directly influenced by bicycle frames that we've looked at. Um, and then in terms of the the rest of the design, uh, I mean, just to speak on a, a, in a little bit more detail, uh, you may see if you see a photo or a video, uh, there's like the curve on it, uh, makes it look super minimalistic and, and sleek. And those types of design aspects were taken from kind of the old timer cars uh, from like back in the day when they had like super nice, uh, interesting shapes. Uh, so both my brother and I are also car enthusiasts. So uh, kind of looking at like wh- how those cars back in the day were designed, We've definitely taken some inspiration from that. And then the third thing is we wanted to make uh, the, so the, for one, the drive feeling super approachable and intuitive, but then also the uh, experience of actually using it. So 
for example, uh, the battery is right under the seat. So it's super easy to take the battery out charge it at any standard output and then put it back into the bike. Uh, that is something that not many companies have done uh, just because it is a difficult process to actually integrate it in a way that you can simply swap the battery out and uh, plug it into the wall. Uh, but we felt that that was super important uh, for one, just for ease of use uh, and also for security, right? Uh, if you think about it, the battery is the most valuable part of the bike. So we wanted to make sure that it's locked away and that it can't be uh, stolen or can be subject to any theft. So let's talk about the anti-theft because that is a point that you guys really emphasize on yeah. a lot of the, the web page and the literature. Yeah. I'm going to make a couple assumptions and then correct me if I'm completely wrong. Anti-theft is for the, the PAVE bike itself, not for the battery specifically. Correct. Um, so is there a way to keep people from just removing the battery if the bike is sitting there and let's say the owner has not removed it and taken the battery with them? Is Have you guys any way to keep people from like tampering with the bike or or just stealing the battery? Because like you said, that is the most valuable part. Yeah. So uh, the bike is equipped with GPS and LTE connectivity. Um, so as an owner, you'll always know where your bike is. So if you leave your bike out on the road, uh, it's locked away. No one can actually open the seat and just take out the battery. So it can be fully locked with the battery in. Um, and the, uh, the, the other thing is that uh, we have sensors in the bike as well uh, that detect if there's any movement. So let's say somebody walks up to the bike, starts sitting on it, shaking it. Uh, you will get a notification on your phone saying, hey, there's some suspicious activity going on. Maybe check on your bike or start the tracking process, basically. So those are the measures that we have in place uh, currently. And we're working on some additional ones to really make sure yeah, uh, we're uh, optimizing uh, our, our anti-theft capabilities. Okay. So I'm going to make another assumption. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. If an owner has removed the battery and let's say they've taken it inside to go charge that. If the battery is not actually in the bike, is there still something powering your LTE and, and all of those sensors so that, um, you know, there isn't an issue where somebody just like picks it up and walks off with it without it being powered for those systems? Is there like a, a backup? Yes. Uh, Okay. There's a backup system in the vehicle uh, that even if you do take out the main battery, uh, it still has the ability to send GPS coordinates or send out a signal uh, via LTE uh, to warn you as an owner that something is happening uh, while your battery is charging in the living room. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that's really important to emphasize that yeah. fact because you've created something that is lightweight. It is easy to move where, you know, that's great for the owner, but if you didn't have all the anti theft built into it, then that yeah. could certainly cause some problems where, you know, somebody yeah. might go out and it's gone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now I want to go back to the design in terms of the visual aesthetics. You mentioned the curve along the bottom bar. There is a kind of cafe racer style to it mm -hmm. with the seat being completely flat to where I guess, if it were a gas powered bike, you know, where typically the, the gas tank would be. Mm -hmm. You've chosen to leave underneath of that in between the wheels and the frame completely open. I'm curious about how you guys came to that decision to leave that open instead of either having paneling or even the shelf for uh, cargo space or something. What, what was the reasoning behind leaving that the way it is? So um, all the photos that you have seen, they, it is open, uh, but we are going to sell an accessory that is basically a center storage that you can uh, put into that open space, uh, which a lot will allow you to actually store uh, whatever you need. Um, so it's big enough to store three or more grocery bags. Uh, so the idea is really, and that's where <clears throat> the utility part comes in. We really wanted to give people the ability to replace their short to medium distance car trips with this vehicle 
So if you have the center storage, you can go to the grocery store. Uh, we also have a rear rack um, where you can yeah, basically strap on different things. And then on the side of the rear rack, there's also going to be uh, what we call pave packs uh, that you can install. It's essentially like a backpack style uh, a bag that you can attach to the side uh, of the rear rack. So there's really, and we're going to work on more accessories and going to release more accessories uh, in the coming months uh, to really increase the utility of the vehicle, uh, as well as give owners the, the ability to customize uh, their uh, for their needs, basically. So purchase the accessories based on what they need. Some people might want the center storage. Some people say, hey, I only uh, bring in uh, a yoga mat wherever I go. So I'm going to use the the rear rack only. So there's really, uh, yeah, we really want to leave that freedom up to the to to the, the owner and the riders of the bike. That is really important, as I'm sure you know. Yeah. Uh, I, for uh, a, a good while, actually, I lived in Florida. I didn't have a car. All I had mm-hmm. was motorcycles. And my first bike, I ended up having saddlebags and yeah. actually built a rear rack for more utility. If I was going yeah. grocery shopping or needed to carry something that was a little bit bigger on the back, um, I mean, I couldn't find a company that had that for that bike. So I had to build a lot of that. So that's that's fantastic that you guys are already thinking of how to supply these things that people mm-hmm. will want. I have a feeling that something like this, that to your point, that it's very approachable. I mean, this is not something that is intimidating uh, really in any way, but then it's also not, I hate to use the word cute, but it doesn't really embody cute either. It's it's kind of halfway in between those as well. So I expect that a lot of owners would personalize the looks as an expression of themselves in addition to having some more functionality in storage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, we encourage that uh, for sure. I mean, the at the moment, we have two versions. Uh, the pave bike comes in uh, uh, a white version as well as a, a dark green version, which is the pave BK Unlimited, which is the version that's more meant for private uh, road usage or uh, yeah, just not on public roads. Uh, so yeah, those are the the two colors that uh, exist. But uh, I mean, we we are looking into the future. What other colors? Um, yeah. Uh, we're going to release so sure i can i mean i can see almost a a limitless possibility (laughs) different colors and designs and you know bright colors combined with like a a darker background or or all sorts of stuff i mean like my creative mind is just going absolutely crazy with yeah Yeah. um i want to talk about the the two different models in terms of the specifications and then once we kind of finish with that, then I want to get into the technology because you guys mm-hmm. are, are doing amazing things with that. In terms of the bikes themselves, naturally, uh, there's going to be limits to how fast you can go without needing a motorcycle license or there's there's, like you said, two different. There's the BK and then a um, was it plus or are you? You for it stands for unlimited, basically. Unlimited, yes. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the BK because that is probably the the majority of what people are going to be looking at. Yeah. So Um, the BK is sorry, go go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. (laughs) No, that's okay. Um, so let's let's talk about you know, um, battery capacity range, even though that's something I don't like to talk about a lot. With something that's under 100 miles, it's important to to point that out. Um, speed you know any licenses that are required all, all of that stuff mm-hmm. so with the pave bk uh that's the model that we're really focusing on um for right now and P- pave bku is the version that we're only that is made to order uh so the pave bk is our, our stock option basically so uh delivery times will adjust depending on if you choose pave bk which will be a lot faster and pave bku will be a little bit longer. Um, In terms of this, I think I'd like to focus on the PAVE BK because that is our stock option. Um, In terms of the specs, uh, the battery uh, rounded comes out to 1.9 kilowatt hours. 
uh, the motor has 3000 watts. Um, the battery range is 50 miles and that depends on drive style, uh, rider weight, general driving conditions. Wind is something that really affects the, the range. Um, and we also have three different drive modes. So we have the normal mode, which is for what we recommend, uh, bike performance, uh, compared to distance. So that's where you really get the, the best of both worlds. Uh, we then have the eco mode, which is really allows you to stretch that distance, uh, up to 60 miles or even more. Uh, and then we have the sport mode, um, that will come uh, basically with every bike, uh, that will really, uh, give you a lot of, uh, acceleration. And that's where the ride fund really, uh, comes in. Uh, I personally love riding in sport mode. Uh, it's, uh, every time the acceleration is just makes it super fun. Uh, but you are sacrificing, um, some, some distance, of course, uh, with like. that. Um, and, uh, in terms of charge time, uh, as I said earlier, you can take out the battery, charge it at any standard outlet, just like you charge your laptop or your phone. Uh, we, the bike comes with a stock charger. It's an overnight charger, uh, that takes about uh, six to six to eight hours of charge time. We then also have a fast charger, which you can charge up to 80% within one hour. So it's super oh. fast. <laughs> um, and that also will be something that will be available on our website to uh, purchase as an extra accessory, basically. How many amps does that fast charger pull? I'm trying to do the math in my head. I mean, 80% of, we'll say, two kilowatt hours in one hour is 1.6 kilowatt hours, roughly yeah, 0.5. I'll have to double check that. Um, that sounds specific. like it, it's going to be pulling some serious current. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, but it is also the max that we can do without damaging the cells, right? Um, sure. mm -hmm. Because that's something we're super cautious about. We don't ever want to damage the cells. So uh, one hour to 80% is, is where, we, where we've where we drawn the line, basically, uh, for you. That's fast enough, um, and it's still well within a, a safety margin. So Now, is that still on uh, 110 AC? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. All right. That, that, that is really quick. That just caught me off guard. I was like, wait a minute. That's, that's pretty, yeah. pretty significant. I imagine because the battery is removable, is it something where you can have a spare battery and just when one gets low or, or I mean, obviously you don't want it to die completely. You could just swap it out if you have another one with you and then just keep going. Absolutely. That's the whole idea. Right. Um, I mean, we have, of course, in our office, we have a ton of batteries that we <laughs> continuously cycle through. But absolutely, the idea is that you can have multiple batteries. You can have a battery at your office. You can have a battery at home. Um, it's uh, yeah, really up to you uh, as the owner of the bike. I'm I'm a car guy as well. Uh, I've been I've worked in motorsport before. I just I love fun and excitement and going fast. So the first thought that comes into my head with a swappable battery is pit stops <laughs> where, you know, where you could have some serious racing for hours and just come in and swap out the battery and then back out. Um, I'm sure you guys are, are not looking into, you know, that type of use case for these just yet, but mm -hmm. um, definitely file that one away for, you know, maybe a year or two down the road and yeah. put together a, the the PRL the Pave Racing League, um, you know <laughs> that would be a lot of fun. I like that idea. Um, I'll definitely keep that one in mind. Because you'll yeah, have to do it down good. here in Virginia, though, so that I can just run out to the track and participate. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's a deal. <laughs> so, I mean, naturally, most people are not going to be using these to to race. I would imagine that the number one use case for this is going to be commuting and running errands. You mentioned that you're, you designed the bikes to be able to handle all weather conditions. I'm curious if you've gotten feedback from potential owners or anybody that you're talking to about they themselves being comfortable in all weather conditions with a bike and being completely naked, not having any kind of windshield or windscreen or even um, like guards for hands and grips. Anything less than we'll call it 60 degrees Fahrenheit. 
at speed, you know, 25, 30, even 35 miles an hour, that can get chilly if you're not dressed properly. Have you guys thought about any of the accessories being things that are are keeping people warmer, maybe a heated seat or grips or even a windshield or something like that to make it a little bit more comfortable for people when that weather is not exactly a sunny 70 degree day? Yeah, so absolutely. We thought of those uh, use cases and those scenarios. Uh, what we're going to focus on is uh, mostly gear around um, those or for those specifically for those types of weather conditions. So uh, specific gloves, uh, rain guards. Um, there's a lot that already does exist, but we're going to make it so that it really integrates just like everything else integrates directly with the paved bike. Um, to make sure that you're uh, yeah, protected from rain. Um, hopefully not, no, but uh, we've driven the bikes in the snow as well. So it's oh, really? uh, um, it's an experience. Yeah, uh, as I said, it's uh, we've built these bikes to withstand um, all sorts of weather conditions and they are meant to be left outside, uh, just like you would leave your 50cc scooter out on the streets. Um, yeah. It's you know you expect it to work uh, when you turn it on, so that's the same experience we're creating with Pave. Sure, okay, that that is that is really awesome, actually, uh, because I have had experience riding year round in the cold. I mean, the the coldest mm-hmm. I ever experienced was um, what was it, twenty six degrees Fahrenheit for like an hour. Um, yeah. And that was just an experience I don't plan on ever. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's cold enough if, and then put wind chill at, you know, from, from speed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That gets really chilly really yeah. quick. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm excited to hear that you guys have thought about all of these things and you want to make this something that somebody could use as their primary or potentially only vehicle in it, in a way that, I mean, this for people that want to do that is going to be a much better option in urban environments. Um, Let's talk about the technology, because Mm -hmm. that is really, I think, what, at least in my mind, is setting you all apart very dramatically. Um, I want to get to the uh, integration of the streamer network and the blockchain and and all of that, I'm just going to let you explain it. Yeah. And then I'll ask some questions because I don't even want to prompt this because I don't even know where to start with it. So I'll just let you kind of. Yeah, take I'll, I'll give you the, the, the kind of the overview. Um, so basically, when we started PAVE, uh, we knew we wanted to design something new, a new concept, um, and then also put uh, the newest and latest technology um, that really makes sense for uh, these types of vehicles. Uh, And one thing was integrating blockchain into these vehicles uh, to give users the ability to, for one, not have a physical key. So you unlock the vehicle with your phone um, and you, we were creating a digital key um, by using uh, a, a token that's, on an Ethereum blockchain. So it's an ERC721 token. Um, so for every Pave bike that exists in the real world, there exists a digital version of it. Um, and you can think of it as your title and as your key in one. So you as an owner, when you walk up to the bike, you have your token in your Pave app, uh, which represents your key. So the bike checks whether you're the truthful owner of that key or of that token. And that's how you unlock it. Uh, so that's that's one thing. Um, and the other thing is that since it is a digital key, and this was also something right from the beginning that we decided to do, we are giving owners and riders the ability to rent out their vehicle to other people on the network uh, with the overall idea in the long run to create a peer-to-peer uh, mobility community that's decentralized where owners can rent out their vehicle to others and have the ability to monetize their vehicle. And renters have the ability to ride unique vehicles um, uh, 
whenever they need it on an as needed uh, basis. And what we've been seeing over the past couple of years is there are some problems with public sharing systems where uh, it's a, for one, it's logistically, it's a lot of work to get the bikes or vehicles, whatever it is, scooters, e-bikes, motorcycles into the right place and, uh, at the right time. That it itself is a big challenge. And the second thing is a lot of times these vehicles are being mistreated because uh, people say it's not mine, so I don't need to care about this type of vehicle. And when you have a more owner or more of a peer-to-peer -peer system, it is more uh, implied that for one, owners are obviously are going to care about their vehicle and rent to people that they think will treat the vehicle the same that they would. Um, so you have a little bit more control. Uh, and that's something that, yeah, we're super excited to to build out. And we really see a way forward there where you have an entire community of people sharing and renting um, uh, each other's vehicles. That is very innovative. Definitely a couple questions. Yeah. Uh, if you're renting to another person, I'm assuming that um, there's some sort of uh, transfer of the token so that the the pave bk can recognize the other person so you're not giving up your phone along with the bike no so you're so both people need to have the pave plus app uh the owner then needs to find the other person on the network so that's done via a network name so you select the person you say okay i want to rent my bike to zach uh here's his address uh, I want him to pick up the bike uh, in Brooklyn uh, and drop it off in Manhattan. And he gets to ride it for three hours and I'm going to charge him X. And if I don't trust him, then I am going to require him to put down a deposit. So because it is a smart contract, uh, the rules of the contract are automatically enforced when something, um, yeah, when when one of the agreed things is is broken so say you drop off the vehicle at a different location that we initially agreed on or the vehicle is damaged or you don't come back with it at all which i hope you don't but uh then that deposit would automatically be gone and that's basically to ensure that yeah two people that may not know each other or ever seen each other can still build up some sort of trust um and that's right. the system we're, we're uh, trying to create so in your example of of riding from Brooklyn to Manhattan, how would the owner get the bike back? Well, they would define that in the contract, right? If they want the bike back at the location where it was picked up, they can define that there. If they say, actually, I'm going out to dinner in Manhattan um, tonight, then and I want my vehicle back after that, then you, know, it, you can decide where you want your vehicle to be at at the end of the rental. Oh, that's neat. That's really neat. And are owners able to set pricing for the rental or is that something yes. that yes. So entirely yes. on their own? They can. Yeah, it's exactly. Exactly. OK. Um, the other question related to that specifically is how would insurance work if they are renting to somebody else and that other person does damage the BK? Yeah. So we I mean, we're not an insurance provider. We're simply all offering the uh, technology and the means of renting out uh, your vehicle to someone else. In the end, it's something uh, you giving your car key or your motorcycle key or your house key to someone else and say, hey, you can stay here. Uh, the insurance side uh, is not something we're touching. Um, so that's between the, the two people. Um, so Okay. Yeah. Um, that's leading me into really an, the idea of where this lands between, you know, your your motorcycle and your bicycle. Bicycles don't require insurance to be on the road. Motorcycles do yes. because you guys are are kind of halfway in between. Um, are there certain insurance requirements that, in order just to to be able to put this on a public road, and then also if you can just talk about any licensing requirements yeah. as well, if somebody needs to have like a motorcycle license. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So the top speed is capped at 30 miles per hour. So federally we fall into what's called the motor driven cycle class. Um, in New York, you may have seen it. It's the same as the um, rebel scooters uh, that 
I'm not sure if you're familiar, but same yeah. vehicle class, which means in most states, you will not need a motorcycle license, a normal car license. Um, only a normal car license is required. And then there are some states where you may need a motorcycle endorsement, which is like not a full test, but just a, yeah, a shorter version, uh, basically. Uh, and then again, depending on the state, you may need insurance, you may not, uh, you may need a helmet, may not. It, it varies from state to state. Uh, we're in the process right now of identifying which states we want to uh, target at the beginning. Um, so we'll take into consideration what does the legal framework look like in those states? Uh, what does the weather look like? Uh, and, and, and things like that, basically. So, sure. Yeah. Sure. It's fascinating because you're creating a vehicle that, that fits in between. There is so much variation because states generally don't really have very many ways of classifying things that don't fall into their predetermined boxes. Right. So, once you know we have more information about all that like what states would be easier for something like this yeah. um naturally i would expect urban areas would be a primary target yeah. um and then i think the low hanging fruit is is areas that uh have great weather so hawaii exactly. southern part of the us like los angeles san diego or even florida um now you still have rain well florida for sure you know rain and thunderstorms and all of that but um I mean, the weather's pretty nice where so somebody could ride one of these as their only vehicle year round every single day, commute to and from work. And that would be fantastic. Um, exactly. Back to the technology, because I know we kind of got away from that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I saw on somewhere um, that the the streamer network was talking about sharing location data and earning money that way as well mm -hmm. i'm hoping that you can elaborate on that i'm happy to to elaborate on that um I so mean, we 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 actually were in talks with streamer and are still um in conversation with them uh about what you just said uh basically giving people the ability to monetize their data uh since we are just launching um and it is a bigger project in itself we wanted to focus on getting the bikes out on the road, making sure the bikes work the way we want them to, uh, people are happy, uh, build out our service network, uh, and maybe add some features. And then as kind of like the next big release, uh, once we have a lot of vehicles in different cities, in different countries, uh, start thinking about the, uh, data aspect in, in more detail. Uh, it's, Without the bikes on the road, there's not going to be any data. So uh, our focus purely lies on on getting the vehicles on the road and making sure that yeah they're they're safe and that they're fun to ride and that uh, yeah, they work as we expect and as the as our buyers would expect them to work. Well, and I think nobody would would fault you for having the focus on that part of it because yeah. without the bikes <laughs> on the road, none of the rest of that is it, it, exactly it, exactly. Transitioning from prototype vehicles to something that is a production road ready mm -hmm. uh, vehicle. I mean, I can only imagine how many challenges and certifications and the like the, the hoops that have to be uh, uh, jumped through just to go from prototype to something that can actually be sold. What has that process been like for you all? And if there's any specific challenges that really jump out as being like the main thing that you've had to hurdle, what would that be as well? Um, so first of all, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, there's uh, a lot of things that both my brother and I did not know uh, before starting this process. So it's, it was a lot of like learning by doing and running into a problem, figuring it out only to discover another problem um but that's uh it that's never got boring basically that's just the way it is um and i would say i mean one of the bigger hurdles that we had to deal with was definitely uh covid uh i know that it's kind of in the past now but for us as a new company that was just kind of getting started i mean we started the company in 2019 and 2020 everything shut down the world was yeah. at a standstill basically especially in asia where a lot of our suppliers are uh 
it was a lot tricky because it, it was 2020 and then it kind of moved over into 2021. There was still delays uh, and increase in costs. And, uh, you know, just navigating the kind of the, the shortages on certain parts and the overpricing on certain parts and just figuring out how are we smart about when to buy a certain part that they don't run out of it because no one had any idea of how long this was going to last. You know, like, was this one year thing is this a two year thing we had no idea so it was a really like it, there was a lot of uncertainty and that i think made it very tricky uh for us so we're super happy that that's not the case anymore and that we have uh suppliers that we're super happy with um and that we have good relationships with because yeah w- without that uh without these relationships and working on those um a lot during covid and after um without that yeah we would have run into some issues and then i would say the thing is uh and that's really been what we've been doing in the past i would say six to eight months has really been a lot of testing so driving the bike as much as possible in different types of conditions uh just to try to uncover uh problems that we may have not thought about before um, because there are things that you just don't know and you can't know uh so yeah, I think those are the two things that yeah we we definitely learned as for one having good relationships uh, and being smart about how you navigate uh, global pandemics uh, <laughs> if there is a strategy and then the second thing is definitely a lot of testing and really focusing on that uh, and that's definitely something we'll we'll continue doing because uh, you can't ever do enough testing as we found for sure for sure I mean. Starting in 2019 might have been the worst time to start, yeah. but there's no way you would have known that. Exactly. Uh, you know, I mean, nobody's got a yeah. crystal ball and says, oh, let's wait until after this future thing that's going to happen. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, the fact that you all made it through that just to begin with, uh, I think is really quite a testament to your your passion and, and really the 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 drive that is pushing to get this done and get this out. So, I mean, naturally there's no surprise that, you know, there's been delays from the original expectations. Yeah. Uh, And, and to your point, testing often takes a lot longer than people imagine as well. uh, Cause in addition to testing in all different types of weather conditions, um, you know, you're going to need a test on different uh, surfaces as well. Exactly. You've you've already said that this does surprisingly well in the snow. Does that translate to gravel or sand or dirt or any kind of off-road uh, possibilities as well? Um, there are some off-road capabilities, um, but it is definitely limited. So it's not something that you would drive in deep sand, uh, for example. It's uh, it has its limits, uh, but it it does work. I mean, and and gravel and in like not like deep sand but in like mediocre <laughs> deep sand it, it it does does work uh, i mean the motor does have a lot of power so it it moves and the vehicle is not super heavy so it doesn't get stuck so um that that that's is good for it it occurs to me we've mentioned a couple times how light it is but we haven't actually said that it's about 100 pounds yeah exactly so i think exactly. i think letting people know hey this is only 100 pounds yeah and you had said it's a three thousand watt motor. Correct. I, I guarantee you, there's people that are either going to be watching or listening that their their mouths just drop when you originally said that figure because that is for something that is this size. That is a lot of power. It's a lot of power. Yeah, um, exactly. Top speed of thirty. How quickly can it get there? Um, under under four seconds. Whew. Okay. So, so we have we we are going or we're working right now on a boost mode. Um, basically, it's similar uh, in in the EV space. Uh, I think it's best known what Tesla has first done, where they had the I think it was called the insanity mode, right? Where you yeah, said, insane uh, mode, mm-hmm. insane insane mode. Um, we'll have something different where you can activate it if you do something with the throttle, uh, where it really draws more power for a limited amount of time. And, uh, it's, yeah, it's really exciting and it's a lot of fun. So, uh, with that, you'll have plenty of acceleration, um, too. 
Yeah. I, don't, I would run any car at a red light. <laughs> yeah. I, I've um, called that kind of thing like electric nitrous. Yeah, exactly. Where you're just like, oh, it's a good. It might be 10, 15 seconds or so, but for that yeah. time, you've got just a little bit more power. Um, naturally, for larger cars and, and that have some something similar, uh, the Genesis GV60 comes to mind. Actually, they've got a button that you can push that says boost. Oh, interesting. Okay. That's great for passing power. Obviously, in urban environments on something that is smaller, that is two wheeled, getting away from everybody else is very important because exactly. anybody that that is a rider of any two wheeled anything will tell yeah. you that they're invisible. They have right. to ride under the assumption that nobody knows they're there naturally the the motorcycle crowd i'm sure is screaming going well loud pipes save lives well with an electric anything you don't have that sound either so exactly. the safest way is to get out of the way and not be around you know multi-ton vehicles that could crush you <laughs> yeah exactly exactly well, th that's something that that I have always had to emphasize in conversations to people that motorcycles or anything, you know, similar to this, the, the safest way to ride is to avoid an accident to begin with versus, mm -hmm. you know, cars are designed to withstand accidents, not avoid them. Well, yeah, bikes exactly. or anything that's two wheeled. And I would say zippy. I don't know if that's a yeah. good word to use for this. Yeah. <laughs> It's all about avoiding those situations to begin with. So I, right, I love right. the idea of having just a little bit extra, maybe off the line to just get away from everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've thought about that as being a safety feature, but in many ways, like the practical use for that would be to be safer. Yeah. We, we definitely think of it as a, like a, it, it, it's a practical use. It, it makes a lot of sense to have uh, something like that because yeah, getting away and being the first out at a red light not only fun, but it also puts you in a better position um, when you're surrounded by other larger vehicles. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to ask about a YouTube video that you guys have on on the PAVE channel. It's the sound of the future. <laughs> Is that, I mean, are these going to sound like that? So that, that sound, the, the motors do have a, like a humming noise um in the video it's a little bit amplified uh it you can hear it uh if you're i mean if we drive it around in our office uh we can hear the sound uh but when driving outside it's it's not as like it's not like a we're not amplifying it so it's not like super loud um and i mean i actually really enjoy that the vehicles are quiet because you can ride next to each other you can have a full conversation it's yeah just like riding a bike basically in terms of the sound because there's just no sound and uh yeah it's it's really really enjoyable um so awesome um now you've mentioned that you're planning on going and actually having these on sale and starting deliveries within the next month or so uh just for the frame of reference for for anybody that might be listening to this by the time I finally get a chance to publish it. Uh, today is uh, August 22nd. So you're talking about September where the reservation holders are going to start getting delivered, you know, what, what they've reserved. Yeah. Um, what's the price of just the BK, you know, by itself? Uh, the, the BK by itself uh, goes for $6,900. That's actually really, really good for what you've got. Um, you know, it's above the e-bike <laughs> price range, but then you're offering something that's a lot more practical and functional, but, you know, certainly not as expensive as an electric motorcycle. So exactly. And pricing, that's where we right there wanted too. to position ourselves. Exactly. If somebody did want a spare battery, what what are they looking at that running in terms of price? Uh, one thousand three hundred for a new oh. battery. So, for somebody that wants to go more than fifty miles, they can easily have a vehicle that's capable of doing that for less than ten grand total. Yeah. Like yeah. Easy. yeah, that is that's actually really exciting. Um, I'm I'm being more specific with those because 
when my wife and I first met uh, 12, oh my gosh, yeah, 12 years ago, mm -hmm. um, I that was when I only had a motorcycle. And so, okay, okay. It's just <laughs> the, the, the feeling of riding around and, and that kind of freedom. And yeah. so, for the last couple of years, as I've entered more of the e, uh, the e mobility space, we are shopping around ourselves for something that might right. be an option. And she's never ridden, and I don't want to put her on the back of like a, a Zero SF or Energica or something because, I mean, that's just it, that's too much. Mm -hmm. uh, but then an e bike isn't as practical, and it doesn't really go as fast, and and everything else. So. Uh, the the irony of this conversation is that you're actually selling me <laughs> quite a bit where that wasn't, you know, my intention going into this, but I'm going, Hmm, that's pretty nice. Uh, for other people that are in the same boat as me, that they're going, you know what? I love the way this sounds. Maybe they do some research and they see the way it looks and they just fall in love with it. Um, right now on the webpage, there's a reservation link. When Correct. you guys go live, will will you have like pricing and the ability to order? Um, do you require all payment up front or can somebody split things into payments or is there any kind of financing option that you guys are considering? We are looking or we're in talks with uh, getting a, a financing partner uh, to give people the ability to uh, split the or finance the, the vehicles as well. So it's uh, it's going to come. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, vehicles are typically the second largest purchase that anybody makes. And a lot of people that would want something like this for the practical use uh, definitely would, would be interested in something like that. Um, we've covered a lot. And, and to be honest, I've been taking notes, but I didn't take notes on everything. So I don't know what we might have missed. Is there anything that before we end that you really feel like you want to hit on uh, that we might have not talked about yet? Um, I think, I mean, in terms of uh, bike specs, uh, our digital uh, focus, accessories. Uh, other than that, not, nothing much to add right now. I mean, we are in the process of, as I was saying, ramping up production uh and we're going to start offering more and more test rides uh here in new york and we're in the process of identifying other locations as well uh so for i guess anybody that is listening that is in new york uh we're always happy to host you for a test ride um it's super fun uh and we're gonna start making more and more announcements uh on our social media um as well as on our email newsletter uh, for for yeah the upcoming test drives uh, sure. and Zach of course if you're ever in New York uh, oh the next time I'm there <laughs> you're gonna know I'm coming that's okay. <laughs> I okay. will make sure of that um, as you identify other states to roll out into and and figure out w the strategy for that are you guys planning on uh, having maybe some like affiliate dealers and kind of having a dealer network so that not yeah. only somebody can handle purchase but then should they ever need any kind of uh, repair work or to get yeah. the tires changed out that they can have somebody local to them that they can take the bike in to do that? Absolutely. And that's exactly, or that's mostly the focus on where, what we're looking at right now and determining which states we want to be in is where can we establish uh, the best dealer slash service network uh, we feel that servicing is super important. Um, and we want to make sure that if something doesn't go, uh, as planned on the vehicle and somebody does need a fix, uh, they have somewhere to go and have the ability to, to get it fixed as soon as possible. Uh, we don't want anybody to have to ship their bike back to us. Uh, and, and we have to fix it and ship it back to them. That's a lot of back and forth. It's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to be a long time. So we're trying to, really focus on making sure that the servicing aspect um, for the, the paid bikes is as simple and as easy as possible. Awesome. Well, Nico, uh, before we end, I've started to ask the people that I'm talking with two questions about themselves. Mm -hmm. So the first one is, what do you drive? Or aside from maybe what you're riding, you, do you have any other vehicles? What, what are you driving? I have a uh, just a, a single speed bicycle that I drive or ride <laughs> that I ride to work. Uh, it's a good 
workout squeezed in in the morning and after work uh, going over the bridge. So, yeah. Okay. All right. And then the second question is kind of a play on the word drive where what drives you, you know, when, like, obviously you're very passionate about providing this to, you know, as we've mentioned, kind of hit that sweet spot between the two uh, uh, modalities. And what, what is it that when you wake up in the morning is really driving you to do what you do? So generally, I mean, we're building a, a physical product that can, that we can actually use uh, and that brings not only a lot of uh, uh, ease to our lifestyle, basically, but also a lot of joy just because it's driving it as super fun. But for me, I would say the biggest driver is then to ha- see other people drive it and get that same type of feeling uh, is super exciting. And so whenever we do test rides and people come back with a smile on their face, like that's a huge motivator for me because that's kind of reassurance that we're going down the right path and that we're building something that people are actually excited about. So I would say that's probably my biggest driver. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to have you elaborate just a little bit on that. If we back up and look at the, the larger picture, why mm-hmm. is that smile or why is, is sharing that experience important to you? Um, you mean the, the sharing the, the joy of, of driving it? Um, well, because, bigger picture what we're doing is we're putting emission-free vehicles on the road right so we're doing something good for the environment and our approach is that if people have something that they enjoy driving that they'll for one tell their friends about it uh and will be a lot more inclined to want to ride such a vehicle as well as with their friends and the friends of their friends so you can really start uh more and more people wanting to have a vehicle that doesn't cause any emissions uh and also it's super fun to drive so that's kind of a yeah bigger picture basically well i mean we've i think covered everything for now certainly i want to leave the door open where as you guys come out with further innovations or various models uh, i'd love to have you come back on for a shorter you know we don't have to talk about an hour because of course we've already introduced the the concept uh but you know just for quick updates to let people know what's going on but in case they really just don't like listening to me and they want to just follow things on their own, you guys are at pavemotors.com. Is that right? Correct. You're on Instagram a lot. I did see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube as well. Yes. Did I miss anything? TikTok. TikTok, TikTok. as well. Okay, of course. I've got a blind spot for TikTok. I I want nothing to do with it. I don't for good or bad, I don't know, but <laughs> uh, until next time. And I know there's until gonna be next time. time. So until then. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Great. Thank you so much, Zach. Have a good one. All right. Thanks for sticking around. I hope you really enjoyed the interview with Nico. I just was floored with all of the great tech. And a lot of the features, they are really showing how just comprehensively they've been thinking about offering this product. So really exciting. On then to the EV resource hotline segment. This is your chance to be featured on the podcast. All you have to do is call in and leave me your EV question, comment, or discussion topic. And there are two easy ways to do this. You can simply use your smartphone's built-in voice recording software, record your message, and do please try to keep it to 90 seconds or less. And then you can email that file to me at hello at ev-resource.com. Alternately, I do have a second way now that I've added to make it super easy for you all. You can take that same 90 second or less question or comment and call in to the EV Resource hotline toll free anytime, day or night. The number is 1-844-387-2428. Again, that's 1-844-EVR-CHAT. And if you know someone special with an upcoming birthday, anniversary, graduation, or some other special occasion, you can give them a unique gift of recorded voices from friends and family telling them why they are special. The recordings can be podcasted or put onto a keepsake. You can visit lifeonrecord.com or follow the link in the show notes to learn more. Before ending, I want to thank the Patreon supporters. And we actually have a new Patreon supporter at the producer tier, Tony Stunts. Thank you for coming on board, Tony. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And I look forward to getting to know you better. 
But I also want to thank everyone else who's been here for a little while, especially at the director tier, Rajiv Narayan and Andy Cooper, Christopher Lawrence at the executive producer tier, and then also at the producer tier joining Tony, we have Bruce Gallant, Charles Hall, and Eric Weber. I want to thank all of the fine people that support me, even if it's not one of the pre-selected tiers. And if you don't quite feel up to a contribution on Patreon, there are a number of other ways that you can support the podcast. Instead of using mandatory membership fees or paywalls, I use advertising and affiliate connections to keep the EV Resource podcast free for all of you. So please consider supporting the sponsors that make EV Resource possible. You can find a full list of organizations and coupon codes at ev-resource.com slash deals. I also have an Amazon affiliate on the web page and a growing collection of products that are on Amazon that I would recommend. You can find that on the EV Resource webpage under the shop section. As always, I invite your feedback via email to hello at ev-resource.com. And that'll be it for this podcast. So thank you so much for watching and listening, and I'll catch you next time.